Let us go to the Lord in prayer as we open his word. Father, you are a holy God. We are reminded, and we will stand before you in heaven, that there will be a silence preceded before the praise as we stand in awe and reverence of who you are. You are a holy God. And so we revere you because there is no one like you. We fear you because your presence is awe-inspiring. Your holiness brings us joy because we have a God that is unalterably good. The same today yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That your holiness drives us to obedience so that we might be like you. Your holiness gives us longing to be in heaven with you, to be in a place where we are not besought by the sin and the frailties of this world. Your holiness gives us hope. That because of what your son, O oh Father, did on the cross, because of what you did, Jesus, that through your sacrifice, you give us your holiness so that we might stand in your presence completely righteous, that we have hope. Oh God, as we open your word this morning, would you remind us that you are a holy God? Would you give us hope for the life and the journey that is ahead? Because, oh God, this journey is hard. And yet you encourage us and remind us that we have a great cloud of witnesses who have gone before, whom we can learn from, where we can find encouragement for the battles that lie before us. We ask all these things by the power of your holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. The way to heaven is ascending. We must be content to travel uphill, though it be hard and tiresome and contrary to the natural bias of the flesh. Though Christ on the cross gives us his holiness so that positionally we may stand righteous before him. The battle of obedience, the battle of walking the Christian life is nonetheless a hard one. It's uphill. It's with the wind in our face. With the world pulling us back and off the edge. And it feels at times that if we just misstep even a little bit, we will go careening off the cliff. And yet one of the greatest comforts in the Christian faith is that we are walking a path that we are not forging. This is not the first time that someone has walked the Christian life, and we are promised that we are not going to be doing it alone because Jesus himself said, I am sending you my Holy Spirit to be with you, to strengthen you. So even though it's going to be a tough climb, God has given us trailblazers, those who've blazed the trail on ahead of us. In American history here in the West, as the pioneers moved towards the West, there were some like Lewis and Clark or others before them that would plow the path that others would follow behind. They would clear the trees, clear the brush, open up the land so that people could follow in their footsteps. The first great trailblazer that God has given us is Christ himself. In Hebrews chapter 4, we're reminded that Christ has been tempted in every way we are. He's been through the battles already. He's been on the path. He's our example, Scripture says in 1 Peter 2. Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we might what? Follow in his footsteps. He has blazed the path ahead of us. He's blazed the trail. Even Paul said 
to those who were coming after him. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Be imitators of me, even as I am of Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. And throughout history, we look at Hebrews 11, we have this great hall of heroes of men and women who followed after God, who fought the battles, been under persecution, even depression and discouragement, and yet we are encouraged to walk by faith even as they did. That they are blazing the trail ahead of us, that we stand on the shoulders of those that go before us. And that we should feel the weight that people are going to stand on our shoulders after we have gone, so what legacy are we leaving? I love studying trailblazers in history, and maybe you've noticed the last couple of weeks, the last few months, I've been using a lot of historical examples of men and women in the faith, because there is so much to be learned as we see people walk the battle of life and recognize that the Christian life is a messy business, isn't it? I mean, marriage is messy. Relationships are messy. Battles for purity are messy. Walking the Christian life is messy. And I find great encouragement in studying the Word of God, studying those in the Old Testament, those great examples, and those in history as well, because they give me encouragement of those who ran the race, even through the messiness of life. David Livingston, someone who I feel familiar with because bring, being raised in Africa. David Livingston is the famed explorer in Africa that lived from 1813 to 1873 in the golden age of exploration. He was a Scotsman. Early on in life, he wanted to study science. He was passionate about science. He wanted to be a doctor, a medical doctor, so he started learning, even as a teenager, 14 hours a day, studying the Word of God and studying science. Then he heard some missionaries come to his church and talk about the great need for missionary doctors in China. He said, so you can use your giftings. I'm passionate about science, and I can use that to further God's kingdom. And he committed his life to going to the mission field, but as a medical doctor. He then heard Robert Moffat, a missionary, come to speak about Africa and talk about the thousands of villages and the millions of Africans who had never heard the name of Christ, and his heart was broken. Moffat said that the interior of Africa was the white man's graveyard. Nobody went there, and those who did didn't come back out. Missionaries were content to dwell on the coastland in their nice little missionary compounds where they tried to bring England or America to the mission field, but David Livingston said, no, we need to go. We need to build relationships with these African peoples. We need to learn their languages. We need to learn their customs. We need to show them the love of Christ, even the way that we act with them. David Livingston took his family deep into interior Africa, and even though history remembers him as an explorer, his motivation was, I want to push back and roll back the unknown of interior Africa so that many, many, many more men and women can come after me so that the African peoples might hear of Christ. He became a passionate advocate for Africa. He became a, a reformer, saying the slave trade that was going on in interior Africa was a travesty against God. But he was a trailblazer, maybe more than most missionaries in history, truly going where people had never gone before. It is said on his tombstone at Westminster Abbey, right there in London, David Livingston, missionary, traveler, philanthropist. For 30 years, his life was spent in an unwearied effort to evangelize the native races, to explore the undiscovered secrets, and to abolish the slave trade. As he worked in his life in ministry, he faced many challenges. And as you read his autobiography, by the, his biography, by the way, you learn that his great weakness was he wasn't a very good parent. He looked back on his life later and said, I wish I would have spent more time with my children. How many of you maybe can echo that and say, I got caught up in such busyness that I forgot to spend time with my children. But unfortunately today, sometimes the pendulum swings both sides. Now today, instead of bringing our family along in ministry for the cause of the kingdom, now we have swung to the other side where family is God practically, and our idol in life. 
Be careful of pendulums on both sides, but he was not a perfect man. But praise God that he uses imperfect people. Are you glad for that this morning? It doesn't excuse our imperfections. It doesn't say, since he was, it's okay that I am imperfect. No. We should constantly strive for holiness. To be a godly husband, a godly dad. But this was an area he struggled with. Later in life, as he was lecturing to a bunch of young men going into the ministry, and then later to the National, the Royal Geographic Society, they asked him, do you regret going to Africa? Do you regret following what you believe God has called you to do and giving up all of the things that this world could offer? And this is what he responded. For my own part, I have never ceased to rejoice that God has appointed me to such an office. People talk of the sacrifice I've made in spending so much of my life in Africa. Is that a sacrifice which brings its own blessed reward in healthful activity, the consciousness of doing good, peace of mind, and a bright hope of a glorious destiny hereafter? Away with the word in such a view, and with such a thought. It is emphatically no sacrifice. Say rather, it is not a sacrifice, but a privilege. Anxiety, sickness, suffering, or danger, now and then with a foregoing of the common conveniences and charities of this life, may make us pause and think, is it worth it? And it causes the spirit to waver and the soul to sink. But let this only be for a moment. All these are nothing compared with the glory which we shall be revealed to us in Christ. So I tell you today, I never made a sacrifice because Christ was worth it. Doesn't mean he was perfect. But he looks back on his life and says, it was worth it. Even all the hardships, even all my imperfections and wrestling, it was worth it. God has given us trailblazers, Heritage Baptists, people of God, first in Christ, then in his holy apostles, and then those who have fallen, men and women after him. And if they could ring from heaven right now and we could hear their voices, they would say, it is worth it. Don't give up. I love studying these men and women because when I get discouraged, I hear their voices it is worth it. This morning we're looking at a trailblazer named John the Baptist, and from the words of Christ himself, there is no one greater in history apart from Christ than this man. A trailblazer. The one who's gone on before, from whom we can learn much. So turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 11, verse 1. We're going to read down to verse 19. Matthew chapter 11, verse 1, down to verse 19. Jesus is wrapping up his teaching around the Sermon on the Mount. He's teaching on the cost of discipleship, what it means to follow. And it's no mistake that Matthew goes right into John the Baptist after talking in Matthew 10 what it's going to mean following Jesus. That's going to be a challenge. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be an uphill path. And it says here, verse 1, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to them, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. 
And if you're willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But what shall I compare to this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating or drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. A lot of verses. But here we get a snapshot of John the Baptist, whom Christ calls the greatest among those born among women. But how do we come onto this scene? John is in prison, it says in verse 1. Yes, John is in prison because he had the audacity to challenge a king. Herod Antipas, which is one of the sons of Herod the Great, he was a wicked, vile man. And Herod Antipas divorced one, well, actually he didn't divorce her yet, he was still married. He fell in love with his brother's wife. They had an affair. And John the Baptist called out, Herod Antipas, and said, you are sinning before God. Well, Herod Antipas didn't like this. So he took John the Baptist and imprisoned him in a place that's called Macarius, near to the village of a, a small little village there at the base of this mountain. It was Herod the Great's, if you will, spring palace. And this is a picture of the location. You can see there are still actually ruins on the very top of it. Even the original floor where perhaps Herod's niece there danced. Niece, daughter, I'm sorry, I'm losing that. Who, who is it? Remind me, you Bible scholars out there. Niece. Thank you. See, even pastors have brain blocks. It's just embarrassing when it happens in the middle of the pulpit. You can go and see, perhaps, the floor she danced on, where she called for John the Baptist's life. John the Baptist was brought there and imprisoned because of his zeal for truth and his proclamation of God. And there is a place right there on the side of the mountain, I've been in there, where you can see an opening where they most likely think this was one of the prisons, perhaps, where John the Baptist was held. You can see the grooves in the rock where the iron door was placed. And here John the Baptist, who after being obedient to God, denying life, living in the desert, saying no to the pleasures of the flesh, being faithful and obedient to God, and where does that land him? In prison. And he's there in prison, looking at these walls, going, I'm not sure I'm going to get out of here. But God, I was faithful to you. I was obedient to you. Why am I here? How many times have we asked those questions in life? But God, didn't I follow you? Didn't I give you everything that I had? Didn't I not try my best to obey? Then why am I in this either realistic, literal, or metaphorical prison where I find myself? Jesus in his compassion knew that his servant needed encouragement. And here's the first point, and I, and I love this because... Jesus has just been talking about what it's going to mean to follow him. We go from Matthew chapter 10, what it is going to be following Christ. And in Matthew 11, we are now going to see our first example of someone who has followed. Now, if you're going to get put out your first example, what are you going to do? You're going to roll out your best example. The guy that doesn't struggle, the guy that has no problems, but... Christ rolls out John the Baptist. And what is John the Baptist? What is the first response that we have from him in chapter 11? He asks this question. Are you the one to come or do we search for another? He sends his disciples all the way across Judea to find Christ there in Galilee, around the Sea of Galilee. I'm struggling, Jesus. He's doubting. He's wrestling. Oh, God. Are you, the one to, are you the one we're supposed to look for? Or is, there, or is there someone else I'm supposed to be looking for? Maybe in his mind, his expectations were, the kingdom is here, that's what he had preached. God is going to judge people. 
but he's going to restore Israel. And now he's sitting in the prison, and it seems like nothing is happening, and he's confused with the plan of God, and now doubt is starting to ravage his heart. You ever been confused with the plan of God? Sitting in that prison of life saying, God, what are you doing? I thought it was going to be this, but you took me down this road instead. And this is where John the Baptist is. It's a very human example. So the first trailblazer that we see is that this trailblazer is not, I didn't struggle, I'm a perfect Christian. No, he's there in his prison cell going, oh God, help me. The Apostle Paul in his prison says later, I have learned therewith in all circumstances to be content in Philippians chapter 4. Learned, that word learned is experientially, I've learned through the battles and the trials, through the discipline of my life to be content even when life doesn't seem to be going the way that I would think. There's a word, weight of circumstances. So the question here from John the Baptist is, I'm a struggling God. This battle is hard. This conflict is deeper than I thought it would be. I thought your timing would be different. Help me. Jesus responds and says, go tell him. Go tell John what you want here and what you see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them, and remind him of this. Blessed are those who aren't offended by me. The answer here for Jesus, he actually doesn't give a straight up yes or no. He says, go and validate what you see and what you hear. See, at the end of the passage, if you look down at verse 19, he says, wisdom is justified by her deeds, meaning that the true result of truth or, or what is good is the actions that are produced. And he's going and saying, Go back and tell John, see the testimony of my words and my actions. Validate to him by my character, by who I am, that I am he that you're looking for. This is beautiful, people. Please hear me out. He doesn't give an apologetic for God. Jesus tells his disciples, just tell him who I am. That in my compassion, I'm touching the lame. That in my love, I'm healing the blind. That I'm reaching to the outcast. See the testimony of my heart. See the care of my person. See that the poor have good news preached to them. Let his doubt be confronted with who God is. What he is doing. Let him be encouraged. See, when we face doubt in life, even like John the Baptist, the answer is not this long apologetic. It's to be confronted with the who of God. Listen to this. John 14, verse 1. The disciples are struggling. And this is Jesus' response. Let not your hearts be troubled. What? Believe in God. Believe in me. Here's the answer. You're struggling, anxiety, doubt, wondering. Look at me. I am God, I am good, I have a plan, I have a purpose, I am with you. Put your focus, put your trust in me, and blessed, I know it's not easy, so blessed are those who are not offended by me, that are willing to trust me even when they don't understand the full picture. This is also Jesus' response is a very clear messianic picture. The Gospel of Matthew is about showing us that Jesus is indeed who he said he was. But blessed are those who are willing to trust who I am, even when they don't fully understand every outworking of my purpose and plan. I think many of us can echo those frustrations and challenges. But Jesus' response is, stay the course, John. Stay the course. Live for this life, for the next life, not this one. And then Jesus turns it around as an example and says to the people, John the Baptist truly is an example of greatness. 
this guy who's in prison, who has no mega church, he has no legacy, he has no printing press ministry, rolling off these books on the life and the works of John the Baptist. His sermons are not being circulated throughout the Middle East via scrolls or email or whatever it may be, or blogs on the internet. And yet this sinful man in prison, Jesus upholds his glory. What does he say? He now turns his attention from the disciples of John who are now leaving to go back to John the Baptist in prison and say, this is what Jesus has said. This is what he's doing. And now Jesus turns his attention to the crowd and he tells them, he says, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? What were you hoping for? A reed shaken by the wind? Somebody that's flopping back and forth with their opinion? Or did you go out to be entertained? Did you expect to see someone in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. Did you go to see someone who is popular and who would be powerful and have all the success of life? Is that what you were looking for? What did you go out to see? A prophet? Jesus then stops and says, yes, I tell you. And more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare a way for you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Jesus is challenging the worldly perspectives of how we measure greatness. Think about it. How do we measure greatness today? cars we drive, the money we have, the houses we own, the positions of power that we exert, the size of church, oh, how many conferences I've gone for, to and, uh, with pastors, and one of the first questions is, how big is your church? Because that's a measurement of then how, must, how godly you must be, right? Well, drawing a crowd has never been a problem in our world. Drawing a crowd for the right reasons, that's what's important. But how do we measure greatness? the size of your business. Whatever it may be, Jesus is challenging that and saying, I want to point the finger on a trailblazer who went before, who I call greatest in the kingdom. No one has risen more than John the Baptist. And so we understand what was greatness for this man. First, he represented Christ. In Matthew chapter 10, do you not remember at the end of chapter 10, we talked about the fact that Christ has called us to represent him? And here is John, the messenger, who says, this prophet who has gone before to prepare the way for Christ, he went not to represent himself, but his Lord. So greatness is first measured by the degree to which you represent Christ. It is first measured by the degree to which people know you as one who has been with Jesus or someone that is about their own agenda. John the Baptist was also one who died to his loyalties, to his relationships, and to his even self. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus just said, if anyone wants to follow me, he must take up his cross, follow me, deny himself. Look at John the Baptist's life. What did he do? He had camel hair for clothing. He wasn't about the wealth of this world. Now listen to me, piety or monastic piety has no value in and of itself. But the denial of self and the denial of goods in its proper place so that we might focus on Christ has immense benefit. And here he is, he's saying, I'm saying no to these things, not because they're inherently wrong, but I'm saying no to these things, and I'm even going to go live in the wilderness. So I might hear from God, I might focus my life, that I might make my life solely focused around him. This is the guy that we feel convicted being around because, my goodness, they challenge our American mindsets and priorities. Hey, hey. You mean they're downsizing their house in order to move into a neighborhood in order to reach people for Christ? That's uncomfortable. We just bought our dream home. Now, don't misunderstand me. I am not saying that goods are inherently evil, but if our hearts are wrapped up in that, what is it? It's not money that's evil. What is it? It's the 
love of them. But we have to ask the question constantly. Where am I putting the things of this world before what Christ has for me? He goes into the desert. We don't really know and have any record of his relationships. That he lived a semi-monastic life to a degree to, to proclaim and focus himself on Christ. And that when Christ shows up, what is his response? His dying to self is, I am not even worthy to unloose his sandals. He didn't say, Jesus, did you see what I've given up? You see my, my lifestyle? Look how holy I am. In spite of all of that, he says, I am not even worthy to untie his sandals. When his disciples shortly before he went to prison said, John, everybody's following this guy, Jesus. John tells his disciples, you've heard me say many times, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He must increase, I must decrease. It's the negation of self so that Christ might be exalted in our life. True measures of greatness is the saying no to what we want in our flesh. You remember what Jonathan Edwards said, I read at the beginning of every sermon, that the journey upward to heaven is against the natural bias of our flesh because we want to hold on to this world. But if he, going back to Matthew 10, is not willing to forsake all relationships, loyalties, and die to self, forsake all of our worldly passions, then he is not worthy of me. Doesn't mean that the battle is easy. Think about Adoniram Judson. We learned about him last year. Going to Burma as a missionary. How he struggled, just like John struggled in the prison. How he wrestled and his heart bled with anguish over the death of his wife and his second wife and his six children. But he stayed faithful. Judson and I'll say also his wives, wives, not all at once, wives sequentially, are great examples of greatness. How do we measure our greatness? truly tell you there's none among born among women that has not risen, risen no one greater than John the Baptist yet the one who at le least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him materially but it's also a double edged statement because it's also the hope that even as great as John was used here the elevation that we are all brought into in heaven is one of great glory now John the Baptist was also an example of someone who's used specifically as a part of God's redemptive plan. He served a purpose. It says from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence. There's been resistance against the kingdom of God. Now this is a challenging verse, and it's such a unique verse in the New Testament that the words here for violence are only, specifically the second word, is only used here in the New Testament, and it's a little ambiguous to be honest. There's two plausible understandings of how to interpret this verse. The first part is very clear. The kingdom of God has suffered violence. It's been resisted. The people of the world resist the kingdom of God. Now, this could mean with the second part, the violent take it by force, meaning some are trying to enter heaven of their own accord. They're trying to do and to work and to live a holy life and to do all the works they can to attain heaven. And yet we know, as Scripture says, heaven is only attained by faith in Christ. There's nothing you do. The second possible rendering is that when we look at the violent taking it by force, it's that it's just difficult to enter heaven. So it's it, it, the, the journey into heaven of following Christ, of course, is by faith alone, but then following him, it's a hard path to choose. So it's almost like you have to violently abase yourself and do everything to follow Christ because it's, it's not an easy path. Now, I believe based on the context from the days of John the Baptist till now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, resistance, and the violent take it by force that this is referring to the Pharisees listening and it's in contrast to John the Baptist and his humility, the religious elite who are doing everything they can to attain it on their own merit. 
The context here, I think, in light of John the Baptist is talking about, hey, remember true greatness, John the Baptist, the example he gave in the humility and giving up. Be careful that you're not so all about yourself that you think everything hangs on you. Heaven hangs on you. No, it's trust in Christ. And here's a reminder for all the prophets and the law, prophesied until John, and if you're willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He has a specific purpose in my redemptive plan. He was sent to come and herald my coming. The world has rejected him. He's re the world has rejected me. And yet he will be held accountable for how well he executed the task that I gave him. And Jesus is looking at John saying, John, don't be discouraged, keep going. And he finished well even though he was unceremoniously executed in that prison. He served a purpose in God's redemptive plan, and the question is for us, what is your purpose in God's redemptive plan? John the Baptist was sent as a forerunner, but we are sent as ambassadors. You are held accountable not to the task that God gave John the Baptist, but you are held accountable for the task that God has given you, to bear witness about him where you are at. How well are you following is it about exalting yourself or abasing yourself like John? Because that's the measure of true greatness. How much Christ is evident in your life? If you're willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come, it says in verse 14. That's a quote from Malachi 4, 5, talking about the prophecy that he's going to send Elijah. Now we know, looking back on this, this is figurative language. So we need to understand sometimes prophecy is used figuratively. But Jesus ends this little discussion about John and says this, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. How shall I compare this generation? God is saying to the people, listen, I came to you, if you will, in joy, telling you good news of joy. There's a God who loves you, who wants to save you, wants to rescue you, and you didn't dance, you didn't care. So then I came with news of mourning that should have caused you to mourn. That if you continue on this path and you do not bow the knee to Christ, that you are going to be accountable to a holy God. And even after I told you that, you didn't mourn. John the Baptist came and you rejected him. You, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, came and you rejected him. What else can I do? How else can I tell you, God, is saying, Christ is saying here, to listen? to those who've gone before to listen to the message, the gospel, and good news, and yet you seem unmoved, people. What is it going to take? This serves as a prelude. If you look at the very next passage we're going to talk about next week, Jesus then issues a dire warning. He says, if you reject the truth, it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for you at the judgment day. Ooh. Heavy stuff. But do you hear the heart of God crying? Why, why are you not responding? I give you a message of joy, you don't come. I give you a message of, of weight, of even judgment, and you're still unmoved. People, we are called to follow Christ. It's going to be a tough time. God has given us trailblazers in his mercy. He has given us clear truth. There's going to be moments of prison moments and discouragement. But Jesus says, remember who I am. He has told us what true greatness is. And he's warned us to be careful not to reject the truth. There is much encouragement to be gleaned from those who've gone before. And again, they say, they ring out from heaven. Don't give up. It's worth it. If you would stand with me this morning with every head bowed and every eye closed. And just the quietness of the moment, think about this. Is it worth it to you? We learned last week that there are going to be rewards in heaven based upon how you live. We all have the unfettered joys of heaven no matter how we live this life, if you are in Christ. But how well we live after we come to Christ, there are if you will, levels of access into the glory and the proximity of the throne. It's going to be a tough time. 
People have gone before you, blazing the trail, saying, hey, stay with it. Blessed is he who is not offended at Christ. What is your part to play in God's redemptive plan? And what about those who come after you, your children? What legacy are you leaving? Has the trail grown up because you have become lazy in the blazing of it? Oh, church, oh, God, help us. When we have those prison moments and we cry out, God, I don't understand, help us. Help us to cast our eyes and find our doubt reconciled in the person and character of who you are, good, sovereign, loving, working your purposes. Father, if there is someone here who thinks that they can attain heaven in their own merit, they're trying to enter heaven by the zeal of their own righteousness, Oh, God, help them to see that that is a fool's errand. That the only hope for their reconciliation and their joy for all of eternity in heaven is to bow the knee and put their faith in Jesus Christ. You, oh God, you, oh Christ, who paid it all. If you were here this morning and you don't know where you stand before God, please come talk to me after the service. Please. Please. And for the rest of us, oh God, would you help us to follow in the footsteps of you and those who've gone before. To know that it is worth it. May you be exalted in our lives today. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All God's people said? God bless. Have a blessed Sunday.